All right, hello. I'm Dimitri. Uh, welcome to the first lecture. Um, I'd like to tell you about the uh, massive uh, asymptotically Euclidean initial data sets, or asymptotically Euclidean manifolds, uh, by means of spinners and one forms. Okay, special thanks to uh, Ojo for all of the organization and um, dedication to these festivals. Uh, it's a pretty special thing. Okay, so uh, let me give you some context in this first lecture. So yeah, I'll give you an outline of how things are gonna go. Um, first of all, <clears throat> okay, this is a subject in mathematical general relativity uh, in which space-time and the physics going on inside of it are modeled by a Lorentzian four manifold. Uh, so this is a four-dimensional manifold, uh, and on the tangent space, yeah, Tn, I, you have a Lorentzian inner product. You know, you can find some basis uh, or some coordinates, T, X, Y, Z, uh, locally in which, um, at least at the tangent space, it looks like this. Uh, okay, so you have a, a distinguished time direction, uh, which has length, uh, which has a negative length uh, and the uh, uh, metric is positive definite in the uh, complementary uh, hypersurface, hyperplane. Uh, okay, so you have uh, some different kinds of vectors. Uh, okay, if a vector points uh, more in the time direction that does in the spatial x, y, z directions, uh, you would say this is uh, time like. And uh, if it points more in the spatial directions than in the uh, time direction, in other words, the length is greater than or equal to zero when measured with h, then uh, you would call this a uh, space-like space -like vector. Okay, so we have this Lorentzian uh, manifold <clears throat> and uh, the physics is modeled by complicated object, you know, symmetric two tensor on n, um, called stress energy tensor, uh, which encodes all the local energy momentum densities of the, the matter and the charges and, and what might uh, be going on in your, in your space time. <clears throat> okay, there's a condition that uh, you'd like to impose on T uh, to make this uh, physically reasonable uh, gadget, which encodes the energy momentum densities of uh, your system, uh, which is that uh, T of V dot this covector, where, you know, this, this eats uh, vectors and gives you a number. So you could think of it as a covector or dualize it to, to a vector. Uh, this should be um, timelike or not space-like. Okay, th this is a condition uh, for T to be a reasonable stress energy tensor. Uh, and Einstein's idea, you know, Einstein's uh, equations roughly say that uh, physics represented on the right-hand side by the tensor T uh, is equal to geometry. So something having to do with the, the geometry of uh, the Lorentzian metric H. Well, if you go around thinking about what are the geometric quantities associated to a pseudo Riemannian manifold, uh, that have the form of a symmetric two tensor. Well, two things come to mind, the metric itself and the, the Ricci tensor. You're kind of uh, forced into this left-hand side. If you want it to be a non-trivial amalgamation of uh, uh, the Ricci tensor and uh, the scalar curvature times the metric. One, if you want both terms to reflect curvature, um, this is the natural sort of object. And this is the right algebraic combination that gives you a divergence free. If you use the, the second Bianchi identity. <clears throat> so um, at least if I am, so if T is zero, which is vacuum, vacuum situation, you would say, uh, there's no, no fields inside, then um, <clears throat> the equations would just become Ricci, minus one half 
scalar curvature h is zero, uh, which you could then trace and find that well, the scalar curvature has to be zero, uh, which then leads you to uh, the conclusion that the Ricci tensor of your Lorentz manifold must vanish. Okay, so the Einstein condition uh, in the case that t is equal to zero. Okay, uh, this, uh, as you may know, is a critical point of uh, the total scalar curvature uh, function. So this is a Lagrangian for uh, this equation. So this equation could be considered the Euler Lagrange equations associated to the total scalar curvature functional. Okay, now there is a general procedure um, to go from a, a you know, there's a, there's a formalism to go from a Lagrangian formulation of a theorem, a theory to a Hamiltonian formulation of the theory. Um, first, you have to separate the time and space variables of, of the theory. So let's make a choice of a space-like hypersurface of the Lorentzian formula. So you imagine n, it's a larger space here. Sitting inside, we have m. Uh, so that the restriction of the metric h is positive definite on the tangent space of m. It's a Ramanian metric. OK. <clears throat> So you get the you inherit a Ramanian metric and you inherit a symmetric two tensor in the second fundamental form, uh, so which we denote by k. You also get a normal vector with length mi length minus one, pointing more or less in the time direction. Okay, so you can abstract uh, the situation and just call uh, uh, MGK uh, an initial data set for the Einstein equations, thinking of trying to prescribe that as initial conditions and solve the Einstein equations forward in time. It's not totally relevant for our discussion yet. Um, <clears throat> but uh, you get the following um, uh, energy uh, and momentum densities, um, which come from just the normal normal part of N this is a function on your three manifold. Uh, and you get uh, the covector Tn dot. OK, which is a, uh, well, the way I've written it here is a one form on M. OK. And the dominant energy condition that uh, we wrote up here translates to the condition that mu should be greater than or equal to the norm of j computed with respect to the Ramanian metric. So you have um, your manifold and we've abstracted the situation. So now that we're just considering m with the Ramanian metric and a symmetric two tensor that represents the second fundamental form. So we want this to be uh, modeling something, some, some local gravitational system, some, some local physics, and uh, everything becoming very flat uh, away from the center of where the action is going on. OK, so uh, rigorously, what does this mean? Uh, what's one way of articulating this? Uh, so perhaps you have something interesting going on here. Uh, but the condition is that after removing some bounded set, some compact set, omega, from your three-dimensional manifold M, uh, there is a chart to R3 minus a ball. And so this is, this is part of the data, call it maybe capital Phi. <clears throat> uh, and this gives you a coordinate system away from omega. Because you, know, you, have, you have the standard coordinates on R3 and you just, well, <laughs> you, have, you have a map to R3 minus a ball. These, this defines coordinates on uh, the asymptotic region. OK, in these coordinates, phi i j, delta i j, k i j, uh, in these coordinates, e i e j, um, the metric should decay to the flat one uh, in this sense. So g i j minus delta i j. These are functions for each fixed i and j. Going from one to three, this is a fixed function on the 
m minus omega. And the condition is that, uh, you know, this is big O, r to the minus tau for some, for some number of tau that's bigger than a half. So in other words, you know, you, you can find some c so that this is less than or equal to one over, uh, or c over um, r to the tau. So I just think the k to zero as r, the distance from the origin in Euclidean space, you know, r3, uh, goes to infinity. Okay, and uh, not only should this be true, uh, but I have this notation of a little subscript r, or a two here, uh, that indicates that this should also be true for derivatives, uh, up to second derivatives of uh, this quantity. Uh, they should decay like derivatives of r to the minus tau decay. So in particular, the you know, derivatives of gij, uh, they should decay in these coordinates, c over you know, maybe some other constant, uh, r to the tau plus one, uh, and so on, or for the second derivative. Uh, and likewise, uh, k should uh, converge to zero. <clears throat> so this, the manifold should not be bending wildly in, in the four-dimensional space. Okay, so in this setup, again, tau should be some number bigger than a half, at least, uh, for this to, for what I'm about to say to make sense. Uh, <clears throat> and suppose the, uh, the energy and momentum densities are integrable, they're L1, they're integrable. Then you have the following quantities, which, you, you can arrive at through the, the formalism that I was alluding to before, uh, when you going from the Lagrangian to the Hamiltonian, separating the space and time variables and uh, trying to recover from the Hamiltonian formulation what the what uh, total mass and total momentum should be, uh, you're led to these definitions. This is what ADM worked out. <clears throat> uh, so the energy of M, or really, the way I've stated things, this is a um, this is the definition uh, of a one-ended uh, asymptotically flat initial data set. It just has one end, but you could imagine it has uh, multiple ends, some other asymptotically flat end, which has its own coordinate chart to R3 minus the ball. Anyways, we're just saying it in terms of the one-ended initial data sets. <clears throat> uh, the energy of this end is given by the following uh, limit. So in these asymptotically flat coordinates, uh, you have spheres of radius R in Rn, in R3 in this case. Um, so these define spheres, SR, one for each R. Uh, and if you compute this quantity, this uh, quantity in terms of first derivatives of the metric, entries of the metric, uh, integrate over these spheres and take the limit as r goes to infinity, that is a, as it turns out, as, as uh, yeah, established by Bartnick, uh, this is uh, independent of uh, that chart phi, so, uh, so this represents a total energy uh, contained in the, uh, in the initial data set. And then for each i equal to one, two, or three, there's a corresponding quantity having to do with uh, the second fundamental form where you would perform a similar integration. Uh, <clears throat> which represents the total linear momentum in some given directions. Here you could imagine uh, you're, from your reference point, maybe you see a, a, a galaxy speeding past you. So some, some galaxy here. Uh, and then, you know, at the next time uh, you see it over here. And then uh, the next time you see uh, it, it moving past you, then uh, the linear momentum uh, of say this uh, this uh, you know Ramanian slice of your space time interpreted as initial data set uh, told the total momentum in that direction would be large 
OK, <clears throat> so a fundamental example. Uh, if you have Minkowski space, which is the flat example, the flat Lorenzian manifold, simply connected manifold, um, which is negative in this time direction here, and then it's flat in these directions. Uh, if you have a, uh, if say here you have a t equals 0, three-dimensional space, that's flat R3. And then if you have a function f from R3 to R uh, with the gradient of f always being less than 1 in norm, then uh, the graph of f inside of Minkowski space, which I'll denote by R31, um, is going to be Ramanian. The fact that the gradient doesn't uh, get, get uh, to 1 or above 1 uh, means that you'll always be more uh, space-like than time-like, so you'll never cross the null threshold. So the, the induced metric will always be Ramanian. Uh, OK, so that will, that's an example of the uh, initial data set. So uh, the graph of F Minkowski space. That's a fundamental example. <clears throat> <coughs> and uh, so if f is big O, just one, uh, one or r, uh, or it, it's big O two, one, uh, then uh, so if it if it decays to a constant and it's, de it's derivative, uh, decays like 1 over r, and the its second derivative decays like 1 over r squared, uh, then uh, the graph will have a total mass, total momentum. The total energy will vanish, and uh, each of the pi's will vanish. Easier to say it this way um, for this example of an initial data set. This is the quintessential example of uh, initial data set with vanishing uh, energy and momentum. OK, so let's consider a special case, <clears throat> uh, which was uh, historically what, what, was, what was considered uh, first. Uh, OK, so suppose we're in a time symmetric situation. Uh, the second fundamental form of our um, Spatial slice in the Lorentzian four manifold, uh, you know, the, the second fundamental form vanishes. So you would imagine, you know, for instance, if you could reverse uh, time uh, about, you know, if you consider, if you thought of this as t equals zero, and if the map t sending uh, or the, the map sending t to minus t uh, was an isometry for n, then you know that that would definitely ensure that. Uh, the t equals zero slice had um, zero second fundamental form. So in general, you know, you would call this time symmetric because it kind of locally admits a, a isometric reflection. <clears throat> time symmetric. OK, uh, so here is the, the relevant theorem um, that one would like to prove. So um, the condition is if you have non-negative local energy momentum density, so mu minus j, non-negative, then the total mass content of the system should be non-negative, which is physically intuitive. But because you went through this kind of complicated uh, uh, formalism going from um, the Lagrangian formulation to the Hamiltonian formulation, uh, and the theory is a little bit complicated because of this, uh, the geometric nature of it. You, you know, you want things to be invariant under different morphisms. Uh, this sort of issue becomes uh, far from obvious. Uh, but okay, so here's the statement for uh, k equal to zero. So we're down here now. So suppose uh, there's no k anymore, just a Ramanian metric. So it decays to the flat metric uh, away from a compact set. Uh, with order tau bigger than a half. And the uh, mu, so in this case, j 
uh, identically vanishes and uh, mu minus j or mu minus norm j just becomes scalar curvature of the Ramanian structure. Okay, so the dominant energy condition just becomes the scalar non-negative condition. Okay, and there is no linear momentum in this case, so the mass just comes from energy. Um, so let's replace these E's with M's, but they're, they're the same thing. You know, mass and energy would be the same, no, no momentum. Um, so the, the relevant condition is, or the relevant conjecture is, if local energy density is non-negative, R greater than or equal to zero, then total energy, total mass should be non-negative. And that's the conjecture, that's the theorem. Uh, also, you should have a rigidity statement. So if there's, if the total energy content is zero, uh, total mass is zero, then uh, the manifold should be flat. The initial data set should just be a uh, flat Euclidean space, just like the T equals zero slice of Minkowski. Okay, so this, uh, <clears throat> This is a very celebrated, well-known version. I call it Ramanian because the K is equal to zero. This is really just a theorem about Ramanian geometry. Uh, first proof, due to Shane and Yao, 79. Very interesting proof. I also, I stated everything here for dimension three. You can make similar statements, conjectures in higher dimensions. Uh, this has been, uh, extended to uh, higher dimensions by Shane and Yao uh, recently. But also, uh, there's a, soon after Shane and Yao's proof, there's a proof due to uh, Ed Witten in the 80s uh, using a very different uh, method that we'll talk about uh, in the next couple of lectures. Uh, and then there's other proofs. So there's a proof using uh, a proof of something much more far reaching called the Penrose conjecture. Uh, for the Romanian version of it, uh, which was proven by Huiskin and Ilmanen, uh, which in particular proves uh, the positive mass theorem. And there was recently a proof due to Yu Li using Ricci flow. And uh, I and some, and some collaborators, namely Hugh Bray, Marcus Curie, and Daniel Stern, uh, gave a new proof using harmonic one forms or harmonic functions however you would like to think of it. <clears throat> okay, so what can we say? Here's an interesting corollary, very non-trivial corollary. Uh, Euclidean space, or R3, I should say, not Rn, as I've stated it, although it's also true for R3, uh, or Rn. Um, <clears throat> flat space has the following extremality property. Uh, so, Here's, here's what I mean when I say this. So if a G prime is a Ramanian metric on R3, so that a G prime, it's equal to the flat metric on M minus a compact set, omega. So you have something going on here inside of omega. And you've only changed the metric on omega. The geometry is all different in omega, but it's identically flat outside of it. Uh, and the scalar curvature is non-negative. So suppose you have done that. Suppose you have made such a metric, a change of the geometry on a compact set to still preserving the scalar non-negative condition. Uh, well, then the theorem says, uh, then you have actually done nothing, and uh, this is uh, the flat metric again. So then G prime is flat. So in other words, there's no way to uh, increase the scalar curvature of R3 with a compact change of uh, the metric. Okay, rather subtle statement. Um, <clears throat> What is the proof? Well, this is a metric G prime. It's definitely asymptotically flat because it's identically flat outside of a compact set. So 
those constants that I was mentioning in the definition of asymptotically flat, uh, those are, you know, all identically zero. You know, the K is identically zero. The, the difference here is identically zero. So the theorem definitely applies. Uh, but also notice that the, the GIJs, the derivatives of GIJ, just identically vanish when R is large enough because the metric's flat. Uh, and in this flat coordinates, um, the, these are just constant numbers. You take derivatives of them, they vanish. Okay, so E and M and P, they all vanish. Everything vanishes uh, for such a metric. So the mass is zero. So the manifold must be flat. Uh, and this is the only, I mean, this, the style of proof is uh, kind of the only, uh, the only uh, method of obtaining a statement like this. Okay, so this is kind of the pure geometry um, statement that you would like to prove in the special case that K is uh, identically vanishing. So why do we have five proofs? Why, why do you need so many proofs of the positive mass theorem? Well, here's the, the rough idea. I mean, so this is a, well, you know, to, to defend myself a little bit, the, um, <clears throat> this is a theorem about scalar curvature. You know, this extremality property of R3 in particular, that, that makes it pretty clear this is a theorem about scalar curvature. And there are, as I've shown here, a zoo of techniques for studying scalar curvature. You have this, you know, hip hop, you know, uh, you know, you got a giraffe over here, you got a rhinoceros over there, uh, all sorts of different uh, techniques from different areas of math. You have uh, spinners, to rock operator, you have minimal surfaces, you have uh, uh, potential theory, you have uh, conformal geometry. A lot of things have a lot to say about scalar curvature. And uh, to understand the nature of scalar curvature <clears throat> uh, and to compare these different techniques, uh, the three-dimensional positive mass theorem is a common meeting ground for a lot of these things. A lot of these tools, if they are effective at studying scalar curvature, they can prove the positive mass theorem and you get to see how they interact. That's something that I hope to get at here uh, to try and see how a couple of different things uh, interact with one another. A couple of these different ways of understanding scalar curvature. Okay, <clears throat> so in general, if you have linear momentum, if you have a non-trivial K, and then perhaps non-trivial uh, components of P, uh, then you would regard um, the total mass of the initial data set as E minus the norm of P, the norm of P being just like the, the square root of the sum of the squares of the p i's. i ranges from one to three. Uh, that would be like the total mass of an end or you know, the total mass of initial data set if it only has one end. <clears throat> you know, you need to subtract off some p uh, because of that sort of thing I was saying before. If you imagine you have a galaxy uh, moving rapidly from your frame of reference, or we're just just moving rapidly uh, then that linear momentum would be large but it's not as if it you know and that the energy would be large because it's moving rapidly uh, however you wouldn't say it it's more massive just because it's has linear momentum so uh, you need to subtract off linear momentum from energy in order to recover something like mass so the, the positive math theorem takes the following form. So for asymptotically flat initial data set, MGK, <clears throat> uh, with integrable uh, mu and norm J, uh, then the dominant energy condition uh, implies that the mass E minus norm P is non-negative. Then moreover, uh, there's a rigidity statement, uh, m is equal to zero, uh, implies that 
MGK uh, arises as uh, submanifold, or another way, in other words, a graph over the t equals zero slice of um, Minkowski space. Okay, so that, that example that we saw earlier with the graph of a function over uh, t equals zero slice is the only way that the, the mass can vanish. Okay, this was a little bit of a, a subtle point here. This last part was not uh, <clears throat> fully established in, in, in each of these, in it, well, in really any of these works alone, um, which we'll comment on uh, in one of the future lectures. Okay, so I would like to describe uh, Witten's proof, uh, which works in the time symmetric and this general setting, and in particular how it relates to um, the more recent proofs that uh, I give with my collaborators. Um, yeah, so in the next lecture, we'll uh, introduce the formalism of spinners and uh, the, the calculation that Witten does to prove the positive mass theorem. Uh, and then in the last lecture, we'll uh, discuss the, the recent versions. Uh, okay, thank you. See you then.